part of the conversation will be happening at 10 past, just so that we all know. Can I give a final reminder just before we kick off to turn your phones on to silent, please? And if you do receive a phone call and you really need to take it, then please take it outside. Please don't stay inside. It's disrespectful to the speakers um, who are giving us their expertise and their time. So without further ado, can I introduce this session of the camera in Jaipur with our speakers, Raha Balana, Sude Kazlawal, and they are in conversation with Giles Tillotson. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session. Some very brief introductions. Well, if the tech team could please bring up the first PowerPoint while I introduce this. Um, my name is Giles Tillotson. I am the consultant director of the museum in the City Palace here in Jaipur. I have with me uh, Rehab Alana, who is the curator of the Alkazi Collection of Photography based in Delhi. He is a prominent writer on the history of photography in, across Asia, actually, and in also on, on modern, modern photography uh, as the editor of PIX. Um, and Sudhir Kaziwal, a prominent citizen of Jaipur who is very well known both as a jeweler and as a photographer. We're going to be talking um, about aspects of photography in Jaipur. It's too big a topic for three people in 30 minutes, but we hope to, to draw out some threads, including you know, across a long time span, that should, I hope, feed into some of your questions um, in the, in the Q&A session. It's well known that, I'm gonna start by talking about, about some images in the, in the palace collection here. It's well known amongst historians of photography in India that one of India's pioneering photographers in the 1860s and 1870s was a Maharaja of Jaipur, Ram Singh II, whose image is, is now on the screen. We have in the museum, in the city palace, nearly 2,000 images produced in his studio in those two decades including the one that you're seeing, which is one of a number of self-portraits. That description immediately requires some unpacking because a self-portrait had taken in the 1860s is not like the kind of self-portraits we all take as selfies on our phones. Um, in that period, it required an enormous amount of cumbersome and expensive equipment and assistance. Um, and so to call it a self-portrait is really to acknowledge that photography in the 1860s is a kind of workshop practice, if you like. It had very often involved more than one, one person. And so when you look at an image like this, um, there is a kind of whole paraphernalia, a whole support system that is not represented in the image. Or more accurately, I should perhaps say, not quite. Because in this particular image, if you look really closely um, at, and, and at, this is a blow up of the same image, you can actually see reflected in the photographer's eye the other people in the room and the camera. We perhaps have a glimpse of some of his assistants in the next image um, on, the, on your left, which shows a couple of uh, three, three guys sort of lounging around in a palace corridor. I'd like to think that these are some of his assistants because um, they, the equipment they have surrounding them includes um, what looks to me like a, a, a chemicals box um, and the tripod for a camera, though I have to admit that the rifle is not usually considered an important part of um, photographic equipment. Um, so we have then in the museum, apart from these 2,000 images, we have some of his cameras, we have some of his lenses, which were procured either directly from, from Europe or through Calcutta. Uh, we have his sensitizing boxes, we have his stamp and so on. We have a diary in which he recorded his, his involvement um, uh, in, in photography. Now, I should explain that Ram Singh's involvement in photography was something that was well known in his own lifetime. He spoke to other photographers, like Louis Rousselet, the French photographer. He spoke to artists, like the, the British artist Val Princep, about his work as an artist. After his death in 1880, it was all forgotten. The equipment was kept in a sealed store, and nobody knew about it for about 100 years until it was rediscovered in the early 1980s by my predecessors in the museum, Ashok Das and Yadawendra Sahai. And they took the stuff out and they, they, they published some of it. They had prints made, this is before the digital days. They had some prints made and they did some publications. And it has attracted a certain amount of interest from, from scholars since then. What I and my colleagues have been doing recently 
is because they printed only a small number as contact prints from the, the glass plate negatives, um, I have now had the entire set of images digitized, uh, digitally copied um, by Himangani Rator, and then further research and writing undertaken by Mrinalini Venkateshwaran. And you can see the fruits of that in a, in, in a gallery, that, that a new gallery that opened last year in the, in, in the City Palace, and in our publication, Painting and Photography at the Jaipur Court, published by, by Niyogi. So that's to explain why this is sort of topical. I want to return to a, to the, a few of the more of the self-portraits, just to say I think what's interesting particularly about the self-portraits is uh, the different ways in which he has himself represented. That he he re understands that photography is partly about projecting personality, but that you know, we all have multiple personalities and he can represent himself in different kinds of ways. So in these two images, the one on the left is a rather more formal one with him um, dressed in this kind of fabulous kind of courtly attire. Um, whereas the one on the right is a much more intimate one of him involved in puja. Um, the image on the right actually is a very famous image. Um, long before we digitized it, it was published by Christopher Pinney and has been much um, discussed as this, this image of a man at prayer. I would like to locate it actually within a tradition of images of pious kings. It's a theme well, well established in Rajput painting and drawing to represent a Maharaja praying in a temple. But it's part of the power of photography, that's like this, so the image on the left now is a drawing of Sawajai Singh, the founder of Jaipur, praying at the Govindev temple. But I think photography does something different. Photography has the power to uh, be much more intrusive, much more invasive, and I think that's one of the themes that will come out um, as, we, as we move forward. Two more images. One shows a kind of domestic image with him, with his dogs, um, and is particularly delightful because of the artless inclusion of the assistant who's trying to hold the, the, the painted backdrop taut. He presumably would have been cropped off a print made by Ram Singh himself, but it's a sort of nice inclusion uh, to see him there to remind us of the processes involved. And then the picture on the right, which is very, very informal, and one wonders really whether he was involved in setting that up or whether that was, in fact, a photograph just taken on his camera by one of his assistants, because he looks tired, you know, at the end of a day's photography, slumped in the chair. Um, it's much more like the kind of informal photographs we might take of our friends and family. He photographed not just himself. He photographed lots of men at his court. Um, Unfortunately for us, he did not label them. He did not need to because he knew who they were. But we have many hundreds of photographs of men at the Jaipur court from his period, which are fascinating for an insight into the different kinds of people who, who worked at the court. They're also, of course, very valuable to um, uh, historians of textiles. And in the publications we've done in the museum, there's a kind of overlap between our work on painting and photography and the work on textiles. Most alluringly and excitingly, he photographed women of the Zanana. There are hundreds of images of women in the Zanana. Now, there, there were other Indian courts, Rahab will explain this no doubt, that, that where women were, were photographed, Hyderabad notably, but to have such a large archive of the, the concubines um, is really very, very exceptional. And I think what is particularly appealing about them is again, what they show us about the women. Uh, they, because we have to ask with images like these, Who's in control here? Because one might imagine it's simply the Maharaja saying, you know, I want you all to be photographed, you line up and I'll take your photograph. You, you are my subjects, you are after all, practically my chattels. But these women look back at the photographer, who is also their Maharaja and their lover, with a steady gaze. They seem also to be at least, you know, the question is, who is in control here? There are two fantasies you could have about this photograph. You can either imagine, because these are actually the same woman in different clothes. So is it Ram Singh saying, come on now, I want one of you in your, your Marathi style um, uh, sari, and, and get that on and come out again? Or is it her saying, oh, take one of me in my other sari kind of thing? I mean, you know, who's, who's in charge of this image? And again, this is the question of control is something that I think is a, is a theme that we'll, 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 we'll pick up as we... As, as we move forward, because in a, in a photograph of this period, the subject has to be involved to some degree. She has to be compliant, at least, um, because it takes so long to take. And one of the diary entries actually is him saying in frustration, couldn't get any work done today because the women wouldn't cooperate. Again, this is the same woman in a different costume. Maddeningly, again, 
he doesn't name any of them because, of course, he knew them all, so he doesn't write their names down. Though I think that um, Mananini found a reference in the Val Princep diary to a favorite um, um, called Ram Suki, and so I'd like to think that this, this, this could be her. I'm going to skip over. Um, there are a couple of other um, images here. One that is kind of a mild bit of cross-dressing, a woman um, wearing her dupatta as a turban, and this, this swagger picture of, of, a, of a woman with a sword. Stepping out, first of all, he's still inside the studio. We think this photograph was actually taken from inside his studio and shows the back of the city palace. I want to um, to keep the time, I'm going to go on very rapidly. Um, he photographed the city, and some of the earliest photographs of Jaipur City are by Ram Singh. There are other photographs by Bourne and Shepherd. This one, of course, is of Bari Chopa, uh, now th then known as Manak Chauk. But I want to focus on this building, because Sudhir is going to show us some photographs of this, the famous, the iconic building of Jaipur. This is not a Ram Singh image. This is a Bourne and Shepherd, the mo commercially most successful company of the period. And they have done what you might expect a British photographer to do. They've got up early in the morning when the light's in the right direction, they've climbed the top of the temple steps opposite, and they've taken a view with as few people around as possible, so you get a picture postcard view of the iconic monument. Ram Singh photographs the same building from the same direction, but does not climb the stairs. Therefore, the foreground is littered with a stone mason's yard. What's going on in his head here? What I would like to think is going on in his head here, he's thinking, okay, Jaipur is already a center of tourism, but it's also a work in progress. This is a Maharaja who built colleges, who built schools, who built hospitals. Indeed, I think these stonemasons are building Maharaja's college, and he is proud to show that work going on. I'm going to end with this image, it's a, a group portrait, but um, because I think this too has themes that the others might bring up in terms of, of control, because it's a group of people obviously working in the palace, and they, they seem by their mixture of types perhaps to be part of the Gunijan Khana, the, 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 the Department of Entertainment. If you look really closely, kind of about third along, I think, in the second row, there's the Maharaja sitting among them. He set up a group portrait, and then he sat very democratically in the second row amongst his employees. What are we to make of this? I'm going to leave that question hanging and hand over to um, Rehab. If we could please, tech team, bring up the second PowerPoint. You want to try last night? Yes. <laughs> well, I, uh, I will begin uh, in another vein in, in one respect. To begin with, I would like to thank Giles for inviting me here. And my continuing education under Giles continues as he was my professor at SOAS. So I come to this panel with a certain degree of self-effacement and um, continuing to sort of expand my knowledge of the period as well. I would like to think about um, a little bit, as we are very located here in the region of Jaipur, to think a little bit outside this region. What the Alkazi collection has, uh, of course, is a sensibility about our subcontinental identity, the history of the subcontinent as a whole. So when we think of India, we must think of the regions around India as well. And of course, this comes to play even within uh, countries such as Nepal, where the Ranas of Nepal were originally, uh, or are originally uh, Rajput. There were Kshatriyas who moved there, and they have a great sort of visual history uh, through the camera and the photograph as well, through one particular family uh, that was the Chitrakar family that were originally scroll painters in the Kathmandu Valley. But uh, we can start the presentation uh, as, as soon as they are ready. Um, I wanted to think a little bit about what Ram Singh is doing. He is the first, as it were, photographer king. Excuse me. Can we have the PowerPoint, please? So he is the first photographer king, but we also have um, Ram Singh within the context of, let us say, the post-mutiny India, or the undivided India that we have in the post-mutiny era. This is somewhat significant because some of the, mo the most important documents that come out uh, during this time period, also at the time of Ram Singh II, are associated with a kind of classificatory value with a kind of surveillance, thank you, Giles, um, of the people of India. And this is where we come to the work of Govindram and Udayram, who are shooting at the same time, or approximately the same time, 
as Ram Singh II. Um, but they are shooting uh, the streets of Lucknow and the people on the streets of Lucknow, the kind of courtly culture uh, more generally. And so what we have is this kind of array, a visual thesaurus of the people um, of Jaipur. And it's interesting uh, to an extent to think about this because the only other document that, that apes this format is the people of India that was commissioned by uh, Lord and Lady Canning mm, in 1868 to 1875. But there is other material uh, that I would like to show you, particularly from the Associated States. Of personal interest to me, of course, is the painted photograph, uh, the kind of layering of a monochromatic image with color. And here you find Ram Singh II, who, and we have a painted photograph of him on the right. On the left, you have Maharana Fateh Singh. And we actually have managed to identify who the artist here is, Pannalal Parasram Gaur. So there is a transaction occurring at some level between an artist, a patron, um, and of course, the photographer. And maybe this is this kind of layering of images you also find with uh, Maharana Jaswan Singh on the left-hand side, a painting of him we find. And on the right, we have Ram Singh again, a glass plate where the face is photographic, but the entire, the rest of the frame is painted over. And the only other object that comes to mind uh, with referencing to this overlaying or this scrapbooking is perhaps the Oriental Races and Tribes of India that was shot approximately at the same time. 1868, where you have false backdrops that are created, and in the foreground you have individuals from the Marathi community, from the Maharashtrian community more generally. But as we go along into this sort of visual reading of the 19th century, we also come upon, let's say, the, the assertion of the British crown. Now here you have Queen Victoria surrounded by prominent photographers of the time. And my understanding is that Ram Singh was one such interesting diplomat who was able to sort of keep the crown, his own aristocracy, and the Thakurs of Jaipur in some kind of equal measure, some kind of balance. And he was a great negotiator. And as a result of that, there's a kind of colonial modernity that comes out of his reign, I think, which is quite curious. And here we have Madhav Singh, who is kind of usurped or taken the position of the British resident who is standing over there, uh, sort of pull the carpet from under him as he is dressed as this, or done the vestiges of um, a Victorian king. And the resident is kind of curiously standing around what, wondering what to do. But we also have this material in the archive, which is, uh, you know, albums, souvenir albums from the 19th century, where the idea of scrapbooking, where the idea of sort of maintaining uh, one's patronage, but also what one is responsible for, in one volume. And so the idea of patronage has also got to do with a sense of connoisseurship, a sense of collecting. They are collectors and they are also patrons. And of course, with Ram Singh, he's a photographer, he's a practitioner. And what does that do to the image more generally? You have uh, Maharana Fateh Singh and a, a group of sort of the Rajputana represented through Kathi visits and cabinet cards. We are informed that there are millions of these circulating uh, in the 19th century. And of course, a lot of these Kathi visits and cabinet cards are made in Europe. They are not made in India. So there's a transaction and circulation of images that is somewhat unprecedented. It is a kind of globalism before globalization. And I'd like us to think about that uh, as well. Here we have the cabinet card verso of Lala Deen Deyal, and I will come back to him very, very briefly. Um, but as you had Ram Singh II, here we have the images of Abbasali, Daroga Abbasali, taken in Lucknow. And I'm sure a lot of us have seen, if not all of us have seen, Umraujan. Well, these are the Umraujans of Lucknow, shot in the 1860s. But I've juxtaposed it with, on the right-hand side, the Begum of Bhopal, who is also extensively documented. And here we have them in the 1860s, photographed by James Waterhouse, who was traveling uh, through the central Indian provinces. And so my understanding actually is that the documentation of women was not extremely rare. It was done to, an, uh, to a great extent, but how these images were shown, where they were shown, who had access to them, that is the point uh, of initiation with regard to this, this subject. And here they are uh, on the top left and top right, postcards by Govindram and Udayram, at the bottom by William Wallace Hooper, taken in South India. So there is a kind of formatting that is constant within the idea of the photograph. 
And there is a reading in which people mention, there are scholars that say that the backdrop is always a normalizing tendency. It is what you have in front of the backdrop, which is what changes our reading of it. I'll move on very, very quickly, and to say that agency was not only um, in the hands of the men who were just enjoying themselves photographing women, but certainly there were women photographers as well, and this is Anupurna Datta uh, from Calcutta, and she was actually in the aftermath of Janarnandini Devi, who was married to Satyendranath Tagore. And so there, there are women photographers in the late 19th century who are also taking images within the Zenana and within their sort of local areas and districts. I would like to compare that maybe with the kind of pictorialism that you get, and I think Ram Singh's work is a kind of portrait-based pictorialism, which goes as far as the early 20th century with uh, Umrao Singh Shergil, and maybe the person photographing him over here is one of his family members, as you know, he was the father of Amrita Shergil. Here we have, which is for me interesting, the performativity that comes into play with someone like uh, Ram Singh II is sort of offset by individuals like Chunnila Al Bhavani Ram. And this is the first image that we have found in the archive of eunuchs or transsexuals taken in the 1880s. I have not found evidence of this ever before. But there is a sense of the tableau, a tableau that continues on very much today with the works of um, Pakistani photographers, and this is one Pakistani resident called Malcolm Hutchison, who's shot a series called Angel Copiers, very much in the trope or the style of Ram Singh. And these are sort of individuals who are also dunning the vestiges of people they encounter in the Orient. Sir Francis Frith, James Robertson, and Roger Fenton. They sort of came towards India, they came to the Orient, and they sort of went native at one point of time. And they started dressing like uh, the people who, they, who were in front of the lens, rather than uh, them being merely practitioners. And so we have Louis Rousselet, who um, Giles mentioned, who also visits Jaipur, who visits and has a discussion with Ram Singh II, who is dressed here very much like a so-called native. But when he's going back to France many years later, he's very much gotten back into his European clothing and is very comfortable there. So when in Rome, I would like to think about viewership, you in the audience, through perhaps the first photograph that was taken of viewers in the 19th century, and this is by Raja Deendayal. It is very much on a stage like this that Deendayal kind of comes up, he puts his camera in the center of the stage, and he takes a photo of the audience. So while we are thinking about, let's say, practitioners, we must also think about the viewer's view. And here we have the idea of an exhibitionary practice that comes into play, even with Ram Singh II. Um, there was an exhibition organized by Holbin Hendley, if I'm not mistaken, in 1883, and a lot of the images from that exhibit in Jaipur were shot by Futcher and Stroud of the Bengal sappers. And we have some images of theirs showing the material culture, the material culture of Jaipur at the time. I'm going to end very, very quickly with some associated material. Lala Deendayal, whose works were also shown in Jaipur, and I believe won the award for photography over here in Jaipur. And so there was this competitive relational idea between photographers uh, that was shared in the 19th century. And in fact, what we have and what I'm going to very much end with is that it was not circumscribed to the, to the court alone, but the streets, the coming of the streets, a documentation of spaces from the ground up. But this general context, and I'm going to end here, Giles, I know we're running out of time, is through images like this. At the same time that Ram Singh is shooting, very, very soon after, we have the famines of India. And I thought I would show this to you, because otherwise we might be under the, the preconception that the material from the 19th century is about kings looking at the people or the people looking at their own selves. But this is an image taken, uh, the Madras famine, where over 10.3 million people perished in 1876. And perhaps these are the complex times in which photography or Ram Singh II must be understood as well. And, you know, as Dickens came up with his book, these were, uh, were difficult times. These were the times of great movements ahead and, and great times of backwardness too. So I will end there with the confounded times of Ram Singh. Thank you very much, uh, Rehab. Can we, can we move rapidly to the third? Can we bring up the third PowerPoint immediately, please? Um, but while, and while that's happening, I just want to say, um, you reminded us, indeed, of the many uses of, of, of photography 
in, in the 19th century, including in, in archaeology, for example. It's um, extensively used. In the, in the gallery in the city palace, um, we've actually juxtaposed the Ram Singh images with those of his contemporaries, with, with, with Laladin Dayal and um, uh, we're, uh, Born and Shepherd. And as a reminder also that he was not just a photographer, he was also a collector of photography, and very often these, these things went together. Could we have the next PowerPoint, please, start starting? Anyway, Sudhir, do you want to start speaking? Hello. Uh, well, thanks to Maharaja Ram Singh, had he not captured these moments of that period, they would have been lost. It's because of his photography that we have all these frozen and still images. So now I'll transport you from the 19th century to 20th and 21st century. And these are some of the images of Jaipur uh, that I have been shooting. So can we start with the first one? Yes, it's on a slide. Could we have the slide show off so that I can manually run them? Did, did, yeah, okay. okay. Can you, sorry, can you turn it off the slide so that it's, we can do it manually? The first one. Oh, yeah, um, you see, photography was not all that easy, was expensive also during Ram Singh's time. But now it's in the palm of your hand. You take pictures, as Ansel Adams once said, you make pictures, you don't take pictures, but I think it has changed now, you just take pictures. Why he said you make pictures? Because when you see these pictures of Ram Singh era, you see that they are painted backdrops, well composed, and they had to have, and I'm sure Ram Singh had thorough knowledge, technical knowledge about photography, the process. And uh, of course, he had a creative mind, which is very, very essential to create a good image. Uh, can we just start this? Uh, if it's difficult, let's just do it as, a, as, as the slideshow then. But can we have the images, please? because I wanted to show how the equipment has changed, transformed with evolution of technology in photography. Okay, well perhaps we can just, uh, well yeah. we're waiting for the images. Um, yeah. When I was discussing with, with uh, Sudhir what, what he might select, one of the things that we were thinking about, because of course I'm, like Rehab, very much steeped in the photography of the past, is the way in which the changing technology um, is, changes what photography can do. Um, when, you have a, when you're working with 19th century equipment, the exposure periods are very long. So it's very difficult, for example, to take... Uh, there are very few photographs of 19th century festivals. Jaipur is a city of festivals. Why are there so few? Because everybody moves. And um, there are one or two successful images by uh, Laladin Dayal, but most images, most street scenes, just show people as a blur. Um, you can you know, do much more, obviously, with, 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 the, with the modern technology, with the modern camera. But the other point that I was alluding to earlier was about the involvement of the participants, about the involvement of the subject. Um, if, you, if you can take a photograph in an instant in the street, you can photograph it anybody. You don't need their consent. You don't even need them to know that that's what you're doing. And uh, this um, profoundly changes, therefore, the kind of phot photograph you can take. There's an image that Sudhir has, which I hope that we can share with you, taken in a cattle fair of a, um, of a, a Rajasthani woman. Um, striking. Um, she's rather like my swagger lady with a sword. She's smoking a biri. Um, but she didn't know that she was being photographed. And when she noticed Sudhir, she responded um, with a stream of choice obscenities. So, I mean, the, the, the relationship between photographer and woman being photographed is different um, in that instance See, from how it was the same thing. Those kinds of uh, impromptu photographs 
were not possible with those bulky wooden cameras uh, in, in Ram Singh's era. Now, the, the new yeah. cameras and with the advent of, uh, well, it was revolutionized by Kodak in um, uh, early 20th century when they came out with this punchline, uh, you press the button and we do the rest. That's when they invented a very small box camera and the photography, and photography went from uh, door to door. And now I think we'll say that you press the button and computer will do the rest. That's the difference between 19th and 21st century. So th there it is. Okay. This was the very famous uh, Kodak ad when they started this film because earlier uh, Ram Singh had to you know, expose the uh, pictures himself and develop them and moreover it had to be done in say in a, in a short span of half an hour with wet collodion plates and then came the glass negatives. But now these images, as you see, were convenient to shoot because of the modern uh, cameras. You know, first one. So, so from... I, I, I could have to um, scroll through because we're running out of time, but perhaps you could just talk okay. over the, uh, the about sequence. The yeah. yeah. These, so, are, these are some uh, pictures of Jaipur that I have shot over the period. And they're, they're from the late 1970s and 1980s. 1970s and 1980s. Now, mm -hmm. this is when uh, this Nehru statue was being installed, I think, in early 70s. Mm -hmm. While it was being installed there, this is the picture of that period. Jamal. This is how Jalmhel or Mansagar Lake used to be earlier. Uh, this is a very geometrical sort of uh, photograph of the observatory. This again is the observatory outside the city palace. And these are, you know, Hawa Mel is one building that is extensively shot by almost everyone. It's like Taj Mahal of Jaipur. But my aim here was to explore different angles of Hawa Mahal so you'll not see the cliched type of Hawa Mahal pictures. And that should be the effort of all the photographers to uh, explore uh, new angles of, of uh, shooting pictures. Yeah, the procession in front there was the Tazia Now this procession. is uh, Ambe Fort. And okay. Now this is also a very historical picture. This is when Jaipur I think we had floods for the first time in 1981, and I hope it was the last time, when Jaipur was completely devastated, and these are pictures of the OTS building on Jawaharlal Nehru. On, on next. Now this is Ram, uh, Ramgarh. For the first time, it was unprecedented that the Ramgarh lake dried, and this was the lake that was supplying water to the city of Jaipur, to the entire city of Jaipur. Now, this is a very unconventional portrait, as we saw in earlier uh, pictures just exhibited. I have deliberately shot a picture without showing her eyes. And this is that beady picture that you were yeah. talking about. It's a very interesting shot. And this was uh, near Jaipur in a fair. And when I spotted this subject, I immediately grabbed my camera the way smugly that she was smoking her beady with green eyes, I immediately grabbed my Laika and clicked this and then went around. I thought I'll make some nice portraits in Ram Singh style. But, but I didn't expect the choicest of abuses from this lady and she hurled a stone at me. So I ran away and saved me and my camera from there. But I was lucky to get this shot. I so I think that what I'm going to do, because we're nearly out of time, and I hope that people will want to ask some questions, is hand the box to you and let you do a slideshow over the question period. If we could please have a mic around. Are there questions that people want to? Should we, should I run is there a question? And can we get a, get a mic? To... And then there's, there's a gentleman um, there and a lady. These are there. some of yeah. the portraits that I'll quickly run through. Myself is Umesh Prashad Singh. I belong to a Rajputana community. After seeing to the pictorial photographs, in Rajput history, one particular statement is very important, that is depiction. Without depiction of that particular pictorialization which you have just mentioned, the entire culture has been depicted. My quest from you is to know, I want to know from you, that when you took the picture, 
and you said that you got uh, hidden somewhere, that, that, that is also a kind of depiction. You depicted. The depiction plays a very important role in Rajput history because I'm also a national general secretary of Akhil Bharatiya Chhatriya Mahasabha. I didn't get the so word. What do you it mean is by depiction? Depicting the, the photographs from the, the photograph, the way you took the photograph. So can you enlighten me on the depiction, the art of depiction and photography? See, photographs are first, they are not shot by the camera, they are, they are shot here in the brain, they are created here. And then you transform that onto the film or in the camera or on the digital uh, form. Can we, can we take the lady in the aisle? Sorry, we're running out of time, so I want to try and get in a few. Please speak. Right. Hello, hi. Uh, I saw your photographs and I love the BD photograph. My question to you is, uh, when does the permission come into play, right, between a photograph and a subject? When do you know that, yes, she or he is allowing me to take the photograph and probably a photographer long back told me that if someone is throwing a stone at you, probably you should delete the photograph because they don't want to be taken. You don't want to be photographed. So when does permission come into play? Thank you. Well, there are issues of, of sensitivity and issues of law. As a matter of fact, none of us have copyright over our own image. You know, if somebody takes a photograph of you in a public place, there's nothing you can do about it. But do you want to say? Well, one of the things that we've been thinking about in the archive is photographs of consent and those of coercion, if that is a direction in which we can go. And certainly when you think about the uprisings that have happened in South Asia, there was a moment at which, or there was a trajectory with which photographs of those who were prisoners of war, their images were taken before they were sent to Kalapani or across to the Andaman Islands to be hung. So there was no question of consent there. There was a sort of overarching authoritarian rule or sort of in a kind of perspective that was put to making a document of those who were criminals. And so those were images of coercion to one extent. Of co consent happens within the space of the studio. And I think it's also the gentleman there who was talking about the illusory quality or the illusion. And that happens a lot within the aspiration of the studio itself. You create that environment with your subject. And so these two sort of equal and opposite um, let's say, uh, composites are already, already working in tandem with each other in the 19th century. I think the idea of copyright is a very, very important one, if that is something that you're trying to indicate as well. And all 19th century material, as you know, is without copyright now, but it is the usage right who has that material and who can actually exercise showing you that material. So all the material that, is, uh, that Giles has shown and all the material that is from the 19th century, especially from these studios, was actually only prepared to be shown to the courtiers and maybe just a few individuals from within the court. What I would like to think about also with Giles is what happens when you begin to unearth this archive and is there a line of discretion that you draw between what you show and do not show? So are there works from the Ram Singh the collection that you are decidedly not showing to the public? Yeah, no, no, we're, we're not, we're not um, censoring any, any of it. Um, uh, no, I mean, but the, 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 there are questions that we have to ask about who he showed these images to. Um, there was an article on the Zanana images by Laura Weinstein where she argues that um, the, the reason for Ram Singh photographing the women of the Zanana was to project a different notion of what a Zanana was from the kind of Orientalist fantasy of a bunch of, you know, chained, in, in, in imprisoned women, as it were, because it, he does show them confidently. I, I, the argument appeals to me, but it supposes an audience for these images. And in fact, so I was pleased when we found this reference in Val Princep, where he is actually showing Val Princep his photographs of the Zanana women. So to that extent, it's, it kind of supports the, uh, the, the argument. But we know as yet very little about the dispersal of Ram Singh's images in his own time. So we don't really know what the consumption of them is. Um, have we got time for one final question? Give the gentleman in the specs. Now, uh, there are, uh, uh, everybody has got this mobile camera and there are billions of photographs being taken every day, every moment. So, uh, what, what would you say that every person is like an immature photographer and uh, <clears throat> with uh, so many images being taken every moment, what effect does it have on uh, photography and has the quality gone down or what exactly uh, in comparison to a time when only kings could take photograph, you know? Yeah, I think Sudhir was touching on that. I mean, it's a much more democratic um, process now than it was in, in Ram Singh's time 
a photography was extremely expensive um, and, 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 and cumbersome. Um, and you know, yes, you needed, you needed money or an investor or a backer to take um, those photographs, the wonderful photographs that Samuel Bourne took in the Himalayas. You know, he had to have an entire team of people carrying his equipment, because also you know, the, 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 the glass plate negative has to be developed instantly. So you're taking your, your laboratory with you. Uh, but I think your question is very important because you're also trying to make a distinction between the amateur and the professional, which today has completely been wiped out. So one could ask this question whether Ram Singh II is an amateur photographer or a professional one. He's certainly uh, highlighted in the Bengal Photographic Society's accounts after the 1870s as a professional photographer, as are just uh, you know, a few hundred people from India as well. But there is this so-called democratizing tendency, the idea that you are in the crowd and taking a view from the crowd, about the crowd. This kind of all-pervasive image is something that really contests this, you know, the kind of hierarchy that we bring to photography today. And I think digitization is one such, or the digital technology is making us question also the analog and therefore us addressing the analog, especially with your photos from the 70s and the 80s, is very interesting because there's material there that that is still being unearthed. And so that is a sort of ongoing discussion. Yes, and uh, I would say that um, the analog photography is there to stay. <laughs> I, I, and I hope it does stay there. In fact, uh, recently Kodak uh, has started remanufacturing of films. And I'm sure after a few years, you'll see that all the photographers are going back to film. And those who haven't seen film will start learning and learn the Ram Singh way. And that's the right way to learn photography. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so we end as we began, where we began. I want to thank Sudhir Kasiwal and Rehab Alana and all of you for making this a lively, if somewhat breathless session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also to you, the audience, for your patience with the technical difficulties. And thank you for attending that session. Oh man, you know I'm like this. <laughs>